Let's take our Bible today and go to the book of Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 18, Genesis chapter 18. And uh, I want to preach uh, on a thought, and you'll see this uh, when I get to the verse on, uh, is anything too hard? Is anything too hard? Uh, it gets hard for us sometimes, and I'll deal with that too. But I think sometimes we just think things are too hard, and we just don't want to do them. And I'm determined to that. I, uh, I remember years ago when we uh, uh, took... Uh, uh, the church, we went down to a little festival, fall festival, uh, down toward Riceville, I believe it was, some kind of pumpkin festival. And uh, they, uh, we got out there and we were racing on these, uh, I don't know, they, you remember that, Miss Beverly, those pedal uh, car bicycle looking things. And uh, I got all the way down, uh, almost to the very last lap, and I quit because it got hard. Now, a lot of times we quit because we think it gets hard and all I liked was one more lap and I'd have been done. Sometimes we just quit a lap early sometimes because it gets hard. But I want to preach today as anything too hard. Genesis chapter 18. Ain't that exciting today, amen? All right, don't let me, don't let me kill this thing before we get started today. Genesis chapter 18. I ask you to stand to your feet today. If you would, we'll reverence the reading of God's word. Are you happy to be in God's house? Say amen. 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 I'm glad to see everybody here today. Let's get excited about serving the Lord. Genesis 18, look in verse 1. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, talking about Abraham. Uh, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked. And lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. And said, My Lord, if now I have favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Boy, ain't that what we need today? Boy, if we found favor in God's sight and the Lord's sight, we certainly don't want him to pass away, do we? We want him to stay with us. Amen. He said, A little, little water, I pray you be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on. For therefore are you come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hasted uh, in, into the tent and unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly uh, three measures of meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched the calf, tender and good, and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and, and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I, now notice, now I want you to pay attention right here. There's three of them standing around right here plus Abraham. And then all of a sudden we get to verse 10 and it becomes singular. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard, heard it in the tent door which was behind him. And now Abraham and Sarah were old, well stricken in age, and he ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. And therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. And then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she, she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. And when the men arose up from thence, he looked toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you today. Thank you for this uh, wonderful uh, singing we've already heard. And Lord, I pray it's been a blessing to people. And, uh, but it's preaching time. And I pray uh, that, Lord, that you'd help us for just a little while. Uh, Lord, just to call back to our mind what you've uh, showed us out of the Word of God. But Lord, we certainly need a touch uh, from you this morning and that from heaven. And Lord, just let me preach what you've uh, given me and uh, move in, uh, in my mouth and in my heart today. And uh, Lord, I pray you'd hinder Satan uh, in this service. And Lord, that you'd have liberty to move upon folks' hearts. And Lord, we really need you. Uh, we really need you. 
I ought to come by and help today. And Lord, I certainly need you. I pray you'd save somebody that might be lost and encourage those that need encouragement and <clears throat> give direction to those that need direction. And Lord, we'll tell you again that we love you. Would you please help us? Lord, I'm looking to heaven for my help today. And we thank you for all that you've done. Save that sinner it's nearest tale for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated today. As we look back in Genesis chapter 17, you'll find that that's not the first time uh, that God had ever made that promise and that to Abraham. If you go back into uh, verse chapter 17 uh, in verse 15, and God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai, uh, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her, Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. And then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old, and shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? So even at a time here, even Abraham uh, uh, struggled in that to believe uh, what God had to say. Uh, let me ask you something today. Have we ever struggled... Uh, uh, at the promises uh, uh, of God. I mean, honestly, there's been times I've struggled uh, at the promises of God. Uh, for him to say, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, or for him to say that you can run unto him and uh, he would be your refuge and hide you uh, uh, and take care of you. Uh, but I want you to understand something. If you read on in the passage, uh, uh, in just a few chapters over, you'll find out exactly what God had to say uh, uh, come to pass. Uh, it come to pass just like God uh, uh, said it would. Uh, you need to understand today that, uh, friend, when God says something, uh, uh, it will uh, uh, come to pass. It's going to happen. I mean, uh, you can't figure it any other way. My word may not be that good, uh, uh, but I know that the word of God is perfect uh, uh, and trustworthy uh, uh, to state my very faith uh, and my very eternity uh, in his word. Uh, you realize that's what we're doing, don't you? Uh, we're staking our very faith and eternity uh, in what God's word uh, has said. Uh, without that book right there, we would know nothing about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we would know nothing about eternity. We'd know nothing about heaven and hell. Uh, we'd know nothing about judgment. Uh, we'd know nothing about him uh, outside of this book today. And I'm glad we have a completed revelation and that of the word of God. Uh, he told us in the book of Isaiah, he said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are your ways my ways, say the Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Our thinking does not always line up with God's way of doing things. Let me ask you something today. How many times have we needed to see God move uh, and wanted God to move and knew that this would be the best thing uh, and God moved, but boy, he sure didn't, he did, sure didn't move uh, uh, like we thought he was going to move. You ever had that happen? I seen move like that. Listen, Psalm chapter 115 said, but our God is in the heavens. Uh, he had done whatsoever uh, he's pleased. You know, God will do it however he wants to do it, when he wants to do it, and how he'll do it today. But he is able, our God is able I, I, to do anything as he chooses today. Now, listen, the word hard. Now, we're talking about hard. What did the Bible say over in verse 14 in the text verse? And here, here Abraham, or, or actually Sarah, excuse me, Sarah, she said, uh, and the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah lie, saying, Shall I? of a surety by a child which am old. And so the Lord just asked the question, is, is, is anything too hard for the Lord? No. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. You know what the word hard means? Uh, it, it means something that is uh, firm or, or solid. We understand that. This is, this is hard right here. This, this pulpit is hard. But it also means uh, uh, not yielding to pressure. Uh, it means difficult. 
are not easily done. And that's what that verse is talking about right there when it talks about is there anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything that is too difficult that he can't do? It means painful or distressing or, uh, or laborious or fatiguing or uh, when we talk about somebody that's hard, they're unfeeling or, or, or not moved with pity or, or not susceptible to kindness or mercy. And I have a hard heart is what that's talking about. But here it talks about is anything too hard for the Lord, too difficult or not easy. You know, I think everything's easy for the Lord. Yeah, I do. I really believe that today. He's the one that created us. He's the one that created this world. I, I listen, and, and, and the short answer and the long answer too, how with the Lord, is there anything too hard? No, the answer is no. So number one this morning, let's, let's just look at this. Uh, uh, is, 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 is it hard uh, to save a sinner? I think the Lord Jesus faced some hard things. I think he, listen, had it not been for him going to Calvary, uh, there's no way that me and you could have got saved today. I mean, what did the Apostle Paul say in 1 Timothy chapter 1? This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. You know, he can save anybody. He'll save folk that mean you don't want him to save. He'll save folk that we don't think is worthy of salvation. He'll save them. He can save him. He'll save the drunk. At least if you go back and you look in that scripture, you'll find out in Mark chapter 5, you'll find a man by the name of Legion over there that was nothing more than full of the devil. Like running through the tombs, he was cutting himself, uh, screaming and hollering day and night. They tried to bind him with chains. Uh, they couldn't tame him. Uh, uh, but yeah, when he came to the Lord, what happened? He got him clothed, seated, and clothed uh, and in his right mind. Something that they had tried and tried to do prior to that, and Jesus done it just like that. They said, He can save a sinner. Think about Mary Magdalene. You know, the Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ cast seven devils out of Mary Magdalene and saved her. And you know, when she got saved, she fell in love with the Lord, didn't she? Go by, hey, I ain't talking about some perverted way, but boy, she just loved Jesus. I, I'm telling you what, when you I, I fall in love with him today, you realize how much you've been forgiven of your sin. I, that's been wiped clean. I, in order to make you love him more and more. I, I, what was it that he asked that lawyer over there? I, he said, who will love the most? I, I, him that's been forgiven little I, or forgiven the most. I, I, he said, the one that's been forgiven the most. I, he said, you've rightfully seen. When you realize how much you've been forgiven, you're loving most. I'm telling you, was it hard for him to save Mary Magdalene? No, it wasn't hard. Was it hard for him to, I believe Nicodemus got saved. I do. He was found with Joseph of Arimathea over there at the body of Christ. They were the ones that took him out and anointed his body. I believe old Nicodemus got saved. Nicodemus wasn't a bad man. He was a good man. But he still needed to get saved. Is it, is it too hard for the Lord to save a sinner? Why well, no, it ain't too hard for the Lord. I mean, what did he say in Luke 19 and 10? I know it's one of my favorite verses. Uh, uh, but for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what he came for was lost people. He came to save sinners. We get to thinking a lot of times that God can't save them. Or God won't save them. Well, of course he'll save them. I mean, he'll say if they'll just come to him, he'll save them. But is it too hard? Well, no, it ain't hard at all. I thought about, as I studied this, I, I thought about Peter, James, and John. Uh, all them boys, well, you know, James and John were the son, sons of thunder, you know, and, and they were just fishermen. And for lack of better words, that's good old boys. And I, I mean, they knew how to work, and they did work, and how they supported their family, but they still needed Jesus. You remember even when Peter realized who the Lord was, he wanted the Lord to get away from him because he said, I'm a sinful man. Peter knew what he was. Hey, I still remember what I was. I was just a sinner needing salvation by grace. And that may be where you're at today. I don't know your heart. I look across the house. I just about say everybody's saved in here. I, I, I don't know. I, I, but I'm telling you that if you'll come to him, he'll save you. It ain't that hard. Even Saul of Char uh, Tarsus who chased the church and persecuted the church and, uh, and, and killed the church. I, I listen, he was able to save Saul. I, just like that right there. It's not hard 
to get saved. It's not hard for God to save a sinner. We've all, for you that are sitting in here today, it's, uh, you know what it's like to get saved and what it is. It's a very easy thing. You say, uh, you're talking about easy believing. No, I'm not talking about easy believing. I'm telling you, salvation is not that hard today. Take your Bible and go to the book of Romans chapter 10. I'm getting ahead of myself, but you know what happens? We as church people make it harder than what it ought to be. Preachers make it harder. Uh, Say people make it harder. Look in Romans chapter 10. Look in verse 9. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord uh, over all is rich unto them that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You believe that he lived, died, and rose again. uh, And and realize that you need him. And you call out to him. He'll save you. What did Peter do in the midst uh, uh, of of the storm uh, when he was out there? You remember what Peter did uh, when he was in that boat? And he gets out and he's walking on the water. And he begins to sink and he sees his situation. What does he say? Lord, save me. I believe that will do the trick. If I could say it that way. A little bit of uh, English vernacular or worldly vernacular. But I believe that would do it. I believe when a sinner comes and wants to get saved, I, I friend, it's about the heart. What's cried out from the heart? God's looking at the heart. I want to know if you want to get saved or not. It's not too hard. We make it hard. I don't believe in easy believism. I don't. What's that mean? That's when you go up to somebody and just get them to make a profession. Uh, uh, listen, just because you had them attract. And I believe you can have somebody attract and they can get saved off that thing right there if God deals with their heart. I, I, but if they don't realize they're lost, I, saying any prayer that they want to say ain't going to help them, friend, until they realize that Jesus, they need Jesus in their life. I'm getting way ahead of myself, but I remember years ago, a uh, young lady come and got saved uh, right here. And uh, there was uh, her, her and her boyfriend was shacking up together. They was living together. And I remember leaving. She got saved that morning. And I, and I remember leaving that day. And me and my wife, is, we do a lot of times, we talk about how service went. And I told her, I remember this. And I, I remember saying, well, we'll find out if that thing was real or not. We'll find out because I'm going to tell you right now, if that's real, then she's not going to go back to doing what she was doing. I come back to church that night and I asked around and asked where she was. I thought, well, if she's got saved, she ought to be back in church. And I remember coming back that night and asking around where she went. She went home that day after she got saved, packed her clothes up and went back home to mom and daddy. That's where she went. And I thought, I believe that girl got it. Amen. I believe she got what was real. Uh, in our life. And I'm going to tell you, salvation uh, becomes real uh, in our life. It's, it's not hard to get saved. Where it gets hard at in salvation uh, uh, is folk want to do it on their own. That's a hard salvation to have. I mean, you can't do it on your own. I mean, Brother Jeff talked about it in Sunday school last week and this week. There is a way which seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Religion will kill you, man. It'll work you to death, leave you empty the whole time, and won't even get you into heaven at the end of it all. Religion will kill you. I'm going to tell you, it gets hard. You know, religion is laborious. Religion is fatiguing. And I know that in service to the Lord we get tired, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm trying to talk, I'm preaching on, uh, is there anything too hard? It's not too hard to get saved, but when folk are trying to work their way into heaven uh, and always trying to do good, 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 uh, uh, to, to outweigh the bad, it'll never work, friend. When you lay your sin upon the Lord Jesus Christ and realize that, that, that God the Father put that sin on him and realize that he took it I, I, for you and me, hey, that changes everything in salvation. I'm not trying to work my way in. I'm getting in on the works of Christ. You realize that? We're getting in on the works of Christ. 
What was it in, in, in Ephesians chapter 4 and one, verse 30? And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. God forgave us because of the Lord Jesus Christ, not for anything we've done. Where it gets hard is folk want to work it on their own or they refuse to believe. You're not going to get anybody saved or see anybody saved until folk believe. You can present the gospel all day long and we're supposed to present the gospel. Uh, one plants, one waters, but it's God that giveth the increase. But until people believe, it, 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 they're not uh, going to they're not going to be able to get saved. They're not going to be able to get into heaven. I thought about the apostle Paul, uh, Saul of Tarsus. Uh, when, when, when the Lord uh, uh, shined that light from heaven uh, uh, he, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? Uh, and the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And then he said this, It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. You know where salvation gets hard at is when folk just won't come. That's where it gets hard at. The conviction gets hard. It, it gets real hard, as a matter of fact. He said, it's, you know, that gold that, uh, that the shepherds had and, and then they had them uh, spikes on it. He, he said, Saul, oh. he said, you're kicking against them things. And he said, it's hard for you to do that. And folk just don't want to give up. I thought about Mark chapter 10. I read about this fellow last week. And then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. And said unto him, you know, this is that one that come to him and said, Lord, what, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And, and the Lord tells him, he says, why callest thou me good? There's none good except one that you follow God in heaven. And, 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 he, and he says, he says, you know the law. And, and he comes on through there and he says, I've kept that from my youth up. And he said, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast and give it to the poor. And now I shall have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had had great possessions. It was going to be hard for him to get saved because he wouldn't give up to what he was holding on to. Some people just will not give up to what they're holding on to. Maybe water baptism. Maybe, maybe I, I want to be very careful what I say right here because I don't want people to understand. That. I want you to understand I'm not trying to talk you out of your salvation. I believe when, when a man, woman, boy, or girl comes and asks the Lord to save them, I believe he'll save them. I believe we've tried too much in a Baptist church to talk people out of their salvation. I believe that with all my heart. I've sat through too many services. But I do think you need to know that you're saved. I think you need to have that settled and nailed down in your heart. And I listen and, 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 and know that the profession that you've made is real, friend. They wouldn't turn loose of something that he was holding on to. You know, if you go to Matthew chapter 19, it talks about how that it's a hard thing for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven and, 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 you know, even the disciples asked that question, uh, that who then can be saved? And, and, and the Lord said, with man this thing is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So nothing's too hard for the Lord. He can save a rich man if he'll just turn loose of his riches. If that's what he's holding on. What was it the Lord said in Luke chapter 9? You ever read Luke chapter 9? Go read Luke chapter 9 and come back and tell me if I ain't telling you the truth. I really believe that Luke chapter 9 is probably one of the most problematic chapters that the Lord ever dealt with uh, in, in his ministry. I, and, and a lot of it was with, some of it was with his disciples over there. And as I heard one preacher say one time, they were back there flipping nickels to say he was going to be the greatest, you know. And I thought, boy, that, that's something to think about. Uh, wouldn't that be a, let me stop right here and say this. Wouldn't you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? Ask that question for just a second. What would it take to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? Well, if I'd done this and this and this. You know what the Lord said? He that is the least would be the greatest. Let that settle in while I preach. He said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. You know why folk can't get saved? They won't deny themselves. They won't turn loose of their sin. They, they won't believe what God has said and they won't quit thinking about their way and doing it their way. He said, deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And he said, for whosoever shall, uh, will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. You've got to give it up for the Lord. It's not hard for God to save a sinner. We make it hard. 
As church people, we make it hard for folk to get saved sometimes. We put so much on people that, uh, man, they, they say, I can't live that life. I can't do that. And let me say this, outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can't live that life. You can't live as a Christian should without His help. But we've put so much on people over the years uh, to tell them they've got to do this and this and this and this. I believe that, that there, there must be, according to the Word of God, there must be a work of repentance uh, in the heart. I don't believe you can get saved without repentance. I mean, you can go through and look at Scripture, but, but, but in my mind, and, 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 and we can argue this point later, uh, in my, when you get saved and you come by faith and accept Christ, you're repenting of your sins and who you are and what you are right then. Because outside of anything else, that's a work. Now, this is where it gets a little hairy sometimes in Scripture, and I realize that, but, but I, I'm going to say this, that if, if you walk out that, you come in here and you tell me you get saved, and you walk out that door, and there's not a change, and there's not a new desire, I tell you you didn't get saved. Something changed on the inside of me. I've had my problems over the years. My flesh has got the best of me. I, I listen, I ain't always lived right, done right, thought right, been right. Hey, I understand that. But something happened on the inside of me the day I got saved. And I didn't realize all that either. Looking back, some things changed. Man, I fell in love with church. I did. I, I mean, I can't understand that. Fell in love with the Lord and fell in love with church. I did. Something happened. I, I, can't, I can't explain all that. Except it was the Lord. But we've got to turn loose of us. Got to turn loose of us. There must be repentance. But I'm going to tell you, if folk go out there, they get saved and walk out them doors out there and we keep telling them that they... That if they mess up one time, then they didn't get it. And man, they, none of us got it. He, he said if, in the book of James, he, he said, if, if, you've been, he said if, if you've offended the law in one point, then, then you're guilty of all of them. Now, I'm not telling you you're going to go out there and mess up. I think we need to strive to live righteous. I like holy and right, or holiness and righteousness. I do. I like holy. But that don't make me better than everybody else. A lot of people have got a misconception. I don't know how we got here, but the boy, it's going to be good. A lot of people have a misconception that, that when you're trying to live holy and righteous, that you think you're better than everybody else. No, that's what unholy and unrighteous people put on the people that are holy and righteous. Why do you want to live that way? You think you're better than I am. It has nothing to do with me thinking that I'm better than you are. It has everything to do that I'm wanting to line up with Christ Jesus the Lord. That's what it has to do with. How you're living does not affect what I'm doing. Whether you live right or holy does not matter to me about my holiness or my righteousness. I think you ought to live holy and righteous. And by the way, we'll see here in a minute that and that's not too hard either. It's not too hard to get saved. Can I tell you, number two, it's not too hard for God to move in your life. A lot of times we just think God ain't, ain't never going to move. We ain't never going to see God work. And, and things, is just it's too hard for Him to do this. We come back to the text verse over here. And, and this is something Abraham, God has promised Abraham. Now listen, God didn't promise Abraham something uh, that could happen naturally. He promised something that's going to have to happen supernaturally. I mean, uh, Sarah has passed the time of bearing children, and this and if this thing happens, I, I, it's it's going to be supernatural. Amen. I mean, without God intervening, listen, how many in our life has been in that shape? It's just too hard for God to to do this. In, in chapter 17, Abraham lives. In chapter 18, Sarah lives. And they life at what God has to say. How many of us have maybe not necessarily lied, but we thought, well, you know, we grinned in our heart and we thought, no, God ain't going to be able to work here. We ain't going to be able to see God move and do something here. Or maybe we really believe that and we didn't grin in life, but we were broken hearted. And we wept and cried and 
thought God will not move here. God can't do something here. God can't move in this situation. And we really believed that. We really believed that it was too hard for God to do something in our life. When's the last time that you prayed, but you really just didn't pray, pray in faith? When you prayed, you really thought, well, I'm going to pray, but I just don't think there's much reason to ask the Lord to do this. It's just going to be too hard. I can't see a way for Him to work it out. When we look through our physical eyes and through our fleshly eyes, it's always going to be too hard for God to work it out. We don't know what God can do. We don't know how God affects hearts. I know a preacher one time, his daughters were at odds with each other. And he got to praying, Lord, do whatever it takes to get my daughters back together on a reconciliation basis. Put them back together. Let me tell you what God done. God let him have a stroke. And in the process of him having a stroke, God put them girls back together. He said, well, boy, I sure ain't going to be praying for God to do whatever it takes. I might have a stroke. See, it gets hard in our mind how, don't you think that's hard, preacher, for God to do that? His prayer was, God, do whatever it takes. I'm telling you, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure that uh, uh, your pastor would have uh, thought that God would have done that. I, I, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I look at some of the things God does, and I know I'm veering out here from the message, but, but what God does, sometimes old Mark thinks God's on fire about some things. I know a preacher right now over in North Carolina, he wasn't living right. And you, some of you heard me tell this story. His three girls were playing in a field on a clear sunny day, and God took one of them by a strike of lightning. To get his attention. That'd be a hard thing to face, wouldn't it? I don't know how I got there, but it's good. We, we, we think God can't move sometimes. The Bible said when, when we pray, he, he said in Psalms 4, he said, But know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Do you realize God's listening to you? He's listening. You living for Him? You living right? You living holy? You living righteous? I don't think you can live any old way you just want to live and then expect to gather up around the altar somewhere and pray and expect God to hear you. I don't. I'll be honest with you. I mean, what, what was it he talked about in Psalm 66? If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Isaiah 59 talks about how that it's our iniquity how that hath cut us off from the face of God. I don't think you can have sin in your life. I think that makes for hard praying in hard times. The Bible said at one point that the ways of a transgressor is hard. You want to sin? Help yourself. It's going to be hard. Psalms 34 said, The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. Have you ever found it uh, hard to pray? I mean just hard to pray. Not know what to pray for, how to pray, feel unworthy to pray. Uh, know what you are. And say, Lord, how is it that you can even hear me, knowing what I am. I mean, sometimes, sometimes listen, there, there's some days that, that, that old Mark knows that he's righteous and in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm trying my best to serve, but then there's some days the devil reminds me of where I come from, what I was. I, I, I thank God I ain't what I was. I, I am different now, but I still remember that I'm a sinner. And I thank boy the God in heaven 
wants to listen to me. Who am I to approach the throne of grace? Right in Hebrews said, us, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may find mercy and grace to help in a time of need. He just didn't say approach it. He said approach it boldly. That means coming in with your head held up. That means coming, hey, I'm telling you, you can come and talk to the Lord. I know it gets hard to pray. I know that we have trouble. I know that we have problems. I, listen, the Bible said in Romans 8, likewise the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we don't know what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. When you don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit prays. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that, that one that resides on the inside, he begins to talk to heaven for you. And he says, look, he don't know, she don't know what to pray for. She don't know how to pray. He don't know how to pray. But let me tell you, this is what they need. <laughs> Ain't you glad of that? He said, he that searcheth the hearts, what is the mind of the Spirit? And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Do you realize that the Holy Spirit, when he prays for you and intercedes for you, he already knows what the will of God is for your life and he's asking for what you need. It's not hard for God to move in your life when we'll let him move. When we'll ask Him to move. When we'll cast on, what is it, First Peter 5 and 7, cast all your care on Him, for He cares for you instead of us holding on to it and us trying to handle it and us trying to take care of it and us holding the burden uh, and us holding the fear uh, uh, and us holding all this and that and this and that. Hey, as long as we've got it, God can't handle it. I feel like I need to hurry. When we refuse to wait on God, God can't help us. Sometimes we've got to wait on Him. That's my biggest problem a lot of times. I want to get a hold of God. I think there's somebody in here this morning. You're thinking God can't help you. That's too hard for God. It ain't too hard for God. It ain't too hard for God. Listen, if you'll cry out to Him, He'll hear and He'll answer and He'll help. He'll come by and help. Ain't you glad God is your help today? He's my helper. We look toward the mountains from which cometh our help, the Lord. Last of all, let me ask you this. How many of us think that it's hard to serve the Lord? Do we think it's hard to serve God? You know what little John said, 1 John chapter 5, he said, For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. What are you going to do with that? Do you know it's not hard to serve God? He said, take, after, after he gave that great verse in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, where he said, Come to me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take you glad that if you're lost, you can come and you can find rest. If this world is wearing you out, you can come and find rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not right with God, you can come and find rest in the Lord Jesus Christ if you'll let him have it. But the next verse said this, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. And you know what the very last verse said? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's not hard to serve God. When we want to follow, we can. You know what made it hard at, 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 in the Latham house when I was growing up? It wasn't my mom and dad. It wasn't the rules of my mom and dad. It was just that old Mark just didn't want to do them. I had something else to do or wanted to do something else or wanted to go my own way or just wanted to be lazy. My mother used to say, she'd say, I tell you to tie your shoes, put your shoes on in time. And she said, you'd sit there. And she said, I'd say it a second time. And you'd just sit there. And she said, I'd get up to whoop you on the third time. And she said, she said, why are you looking at Gunner? <laughs> she said, you'd get up. She said, I'd get up the third time. Jennifer had to crane her neck all the way around and look at Gunner, you know. And uh, she said, I'd get up the third time. And she said, you'd grab your shoes up and say, well, I'm putting them on, Mama. That's what I'd say. You know, a lot of times we wait until the Lord really, really has to get our attention. 
And then we tell him, well, we're doing it, Lord. Serving him is not hard. But can I say this? I've thought about this because I know the reality and the truth of this, that in the service, it does get hard. Well, what do you mean? What did he say in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2? He said, thou, thou, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You know, most men that are in the military, they want to be in the military today. That, that we ain't drafting nobody. And I know the judge sends a few along the way, but most people that are there wants to be there. They have chose that life. Do you realize being a soldier is hard? Some of you all have served. You know it's hard. Especially when you first get there. They got you marching all the time. They got you serving all the time. It's rigorous sometimes. Hey, I'm going to tell you, sometimes the battle gets hard because we do have an adversary uh, and it's just tough sometimes. Ain't your adversary mean? My adversary's mean. He'll drag stuff. I, I've been thinking about this. He'll drag stuff up on you that happened a long time ago and he'll worry you to death over that stuff. I'm not, I'm not talking about stuff that ain't real. I'm talking about stuff that's real. Something maybe you done, he, I mean, that he can accuse you with. But it's under the blood. If you got saved, it's under, well, I've done it since I, it's under the blood. You realize you got forgiven of all your sins, past, present, and future when you got saved. Now, I realize you got to deal with those things. I understand that. You got to deal with your sin. You got to deal with your relationship with Christ Jesus the Lord. But I'm talking about being forgiven, the slate wiped clean. I'm still just as saved the day that I was when I got saved. Now, boy, what a great day it was when I learned that, that Jesus forgave me of all sin. But there's hardness because of the adversary. He's hard to deal with sometimes. But greater is he that's within you than he that's in the world. He can help you overcome that hardness. You of God, little children, have overcome them because greater is he that's within you than he that's in the world. Sometimes it gets hard because, listen, along this life, along this life, Hard things happen. We do go down to the funeral home and stand in a line. We do have people come through the receiving line as we say goodbye to somebody that we love. And we have to stand down there. And this is what I've never understood. We stand down there with a smile on our face and shake people's hands and tell them that we're glad to see them, that they come by. And you know why we're able to do that? You know why we're able to do that? Because if that person laying in that casket is saved, we realize that that's not the last time we'll see them again. We're going to miss them. It's going to be hard to say goodbye. They shut that lid for the last time. It makes a difference, man. But there's one in heaven that can help us through the hardness of this life. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Lord, I ain't going to make it this time. I ain't going to get through it this time. And you know what he does? He just comes by and he hugs up on your heart and he loves you. Let's bow our heads this morning.